Hey folks, I've got a new favourite YouTuber. His name is Bob Chipman. He goes by the name of Movie Bob, and as his name suggests, he mainly does film reviews. They're very good film reviews. They're insightful, but very engagingly presented. But he also, and this is what I really like, does these kind of medium to long form movie essays. He's got an occasional series going called Really That Good in which he examines movies which are generally accepted as having been good movies. He's not trying to sort of, you know, pluck something obscure and convince you that it was a forgotten classic. He does stuff that everybody likes, like Ghostbusters or, or, or like The Matrix, and, and, and goes into great length about why they worked as well as they did. This is a great series. In um, particular, he's, he's very rhapsodic about the first two um, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. Sometimes he can make you see things in a different light. He's uh, very, very fond of Independence Day, which is a film I'd never really thought about as anything other than Empty Spectacle, but he actually was more or less convinced me that there were maybe a couple of thematic layers going on in there that I'd never noticed before. But he also has a, 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 a series which he calls uh, Bob Fixes the Movies, in which he looks at maybe movie franchises which have run aground or gone astray and, and, and expounds on how he would set them right. Or indeed, just how he would have done something differently. So he's done a, an excellent piece on how to finally make Fantastic Four movies good. And in particular, how to bring the Fantastic Four into the extended Marvel Universe, which, if Disney actually do buy 20th Century Fox, suddenly becomes a lot more probable than it was heretofore. But I was uh, looking at this, and uh, I just thought maybe it might be fun to uh, to shamelessly still, I mean, to adapt this idea uh, and, and to talk about maybe some of the things that aren't so much on Bob's cultural radar. So, uh, in that spirit, here is how I would have brought back Doctor Who. Now, it's interesting to reflect that when it was announced that Doctor Who was being revived, about 14 years ago, around the time of the 40th anniversary, sort of November 2003, when it was announced that it was actually being brought back, fandom in general was kind of on edge about the whole idea of bringing it back. First of all, a lot of us didn't believe it. I didn't believe it to begin with, because um, there had been so many announcements made with varying degrees of conviction that it was coming back uh, over the years between its original cancellation in 1989 and its eventual resurrection at the end of 2003. There have been so many false dawns. It was, it was going to be, uh, you know, co-production with, uh, with, with, with Amblin Entertainment starring Donald Sutherland. It was going to be a, a British movie made by Paul W.S. Anderson starring Gary Oldman. It was going to be an American series starring Sean Bean. These were all stories in the press at some point over that period of time. So that when it was announced in 2003 that it was coming back, first of all, I like it. I think a lot of fans thought, oh yeah, whatever. Um, actually, what also caused a bit of confusion is that it coincided with the BBC posting online a flash animation Doctor Who story called Scream of the Schalke, written by Paul Cornell and starring the voice of Richard E. Grant as an ultimately non-canonical Ninth Doctor. That coincided very closely with the announcement of the bringing back of the, of, of, of the series proper to the point where when I think some of us read it in the papers thought, no, no, you've got that wrong. No, you're wrong. No, they haven't brought it back. It's, it's, it's a web cartoon, seriously. Um, but then in due course it turned out that it was actually coming back. And like I say, a lot of fans were very much on edge about the whole concept. And I think we were very nervous about how they were going to go about bringing it back and, and what the format was going to be and uh, how it was going to be updated or not updated. And, and we all just really wanted them to get it right because, of course, it had already been brought back once and it didn't work. As I'm sure most of you know, in 1996, there was a one-off 90-minute TV movie, uh, co-production with Fox in the States, starring Paul McGann as the Eighth Doctor, which was very well received in this country, but I think in the States it was scheduled it, it, it was it broadcast without an awful lot of fanfare or contextualization and i think it was scheduled opposite like the season finale of roseanne or something and so it pretty much sank without trace because it wasn't meant to be a one-off it wasn't solely meant to be a one-off it was designed to be a kind of backdoor pilot in the hope of becoming a new series and then and of course it didn't happen so i and I, I think a lot of doctor who fans after the failure of the 96 uh tv movie just thought well that's that that's it it's gone it's gone. It's never coming back. You don't cancel something, bring it back, have it not work, and then bring it back again. That's it. It's all over. And so fans being what we are, I think we'd all, at some point in our heads, at some point since 1989, thought about how we would bring back Doctor Who, were it up to us. And I think this announcement very much sharpened this thought in all our heads to the point where we actually started to formulate quite specifically how we bring it back. And I know I did. I came up with a, a whole format, new show Bible and everything. And uh, I think 
like I say, Doctor Who fans all over the country, all over the world did this. The one who got the job, of course, was Russell T. Davis, because unlike most of the rest of us fans, he had uh, gainfully employed his time during the interregnum to become one of Britain's most respected TV writers. And so when the decision was made to bring it back, Big Russell got the gig. And he pretty much nailed it, let's face it. Well, in evidence of the fact that it's 12 years later and it's still going. It is odd to reflect, actually, isn't it, that just this bit of Doctor Who is already one of the longest running TV shows of all time. Yeah, never mind the 26 years of the previous iteration or the 16 years in the wilderness. Just the bit since they brought it back has already outlasted every iteration of Star Trek, for example. And uh, we're on to our fourth, just about to debut our fifth Doctor of the new phase. But yeah, I very much had a very clear idea of how I was going to bring Doctor Who back. So, how would I have done it? Well... Almost exactly how they did do it, with a couple of fairly major tweaks. You see, in much the same way that I said after The Force Awakens came out, in defense of George Lucas, unlike J.J. Abrams, when George Lucas came to make the Star Wars prequels, George Lucas didn't have the Star Wars prequels as an example of how not to make Star Wars movies. When they made the 1996 TV movie starring Paul McGann, they didn't have the 1996 TV movie starring Paul McGann as an example of how you don't bring Doctor Who back. Because while it got a few things right, it got some very fundamental things wrong. Things it got right, Paul McGann is great. Perfect casting. It's good that he then essentially became the, the resident Doctor of the Audio Adventures for, for the next... Well, a couple of decades now, almost, and uh, was finally given a decent send-off in the little uh, webisode that came out with the 50th anniversary. Um, so that was good. The, the interior of the TARDIS is gorgeous. It's this big, cavernous steampunk thing, uh, fairly obviously inspired by the wood panel console room that was uh, debuted in the mid-period Tom Baker era, but uh, it's also obviously a very obvious um, influence on the design of the subsequent TARDIS interiors from the in, in the new show, specifically the floor-to-ceiling time rotor, and just the sheer scale of the thing. It's gorgeous. But it gets a lot of things really, really wrong. And the big thing that it gets wrong is this. You can't have 33 years of backstory and a plot in an hour and a half. You see, the TV movie, for some reason, decides that it has to bring everybody up to speed on basically every salient bit of the Doctor Who mythos. This presumably being the, uh, an outreach to, to, to new or casual viewers. Oh, you're not familiar with Doctor Who? Well, let's tell you all about it. So you have these... You know, you have the explanatory voiceover, you have uh, big info dump bits of, of exposition, kind of trying to fill you in on the whole of the Doctor Who mythos up to and including that point. And it just overloads the whole thing. You, they bring in Sylvester McCoy as the seventh Doctor, purely in order to kill him off and turn him into Paul McGann. Just so you say, see, this all ties into the old show. Then, because they do that, Paul McGann, as this perfectly cast new Doctor, doesn't really get an awful lot of Doctor Who stuff to do. He's not in it at all for the first 20 minutes. Then he's amnesiac and wandering around in a sheet for another 10 or 15 minutes. Then he's amnesiac and wandering around in what ultimately becomes his costume for another 10 or 15 minutes. Then he remembers who he is and gets about two scenes as Doctor Who and then the film's over. So it kind of squanders him as well. But the thing is, you don't need to bring in all that backstory. You don't need to tell the audience about Gallifrey. You don't need to tell the audience about regenerations or indeed the 12 regenerations slash 13 incarnations rule. You don't need to tell them about the Eye of Harmony or Rassilon or any of that stuff. You don't need to tell them anything. Here's all you need to know. Here's all you need to tell a new audience about Doctor Who to get Doctor Who up and running as a concept. One. He calls himself the Doctor. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be using he for the Doctor in this, okay? I know Time Lords are all now officially gender fluid and about to have our first canonical female Doctor, but I can't be bothered with they as the non-gender specific pronoun because, let's be honest, it doesn't really work very well as a non-gender specific pronoun and maybe we need to come up with a whole new word. So, for the purposes of this essay, I'm going to call the Doctor he. Sorry about that. Sorry if that means I'm no longer an ally, all right? But anyway, one... He calls himself the Doctor. Two, he looks human, but may not be. Three, he has an immensely powerful space-time ship, which is disguised as an antique phone box. Four, he zips around space and time, doing good deeds. That's it. 
That's all you need to know to get this concept up and running. And that can be dealt with quite successfully in two lines of dialogue and a decent reveal for the TARDIS interior. Because that's the other thing the TV movie gets wrong, is it squanders that beautiful TARDIS interior by showing you in the wrong way. Right? It starts off with a shot of the TARDIS, the box, spinning through space, and then it cuts to the inside, to this vast kind of gothic library, which is the TARDIS interior in that movie. Now, if this is meant to be reaching out to a new viewer, why would new viewers make that intuitive leap that this vast space is inside that box? They wouldn't. They think we just cut to some other place and time entirely. The way you've got to do the reveal of the TARDIS interior is the way they did it in the original show in 63, the way they did it in 2005, and the way they've done it when they've introduced pretty much every new companion in the whole show, which is you start by the companion meeting the Doctor, the companion follows the Doctor into the box, big reveal. That's the way you do it. You can't just assume the audience is going to guess that this big space is inside that little box. That's just nonsensical. You see, when the show began in 1963, that was all that they told you. That was all that they, 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 they get, that was all the information they gave the viewers. It's called The Doctor, may or may not be human, spaceship inside a phone box, does good deeds. In fact, even the does good deeds is a bit questionable because the Doctor to begin with was actually quite a morally complex character. But ultimately, he became a travelling hero and he goes through space and time doing good deeds. They didn't give the audience any other information, largely because I think when the show started, they hadn't really decided yet. Um, you've got to remember that the Time Lords weren't introduced for the first six years partly because up until that point, they'd never really defined what the Doctor's background was. Now, there was actually a show Bible written in 1963, given out to the writers. And I think the original concept, although it was never going to be explained in the show, was that the Doctor and his granddaughter Susan were fugitives, but probably from some far-flung Earth society of the distant future, not necessarily from an alien planet, but they were humans in the very distant future. And this is going to place um, a forward limit on how far in time they could go that they could only travel in what was their past. They couldn't go any further forward than the future they came from. That's quite a neat idea, actually, when you think about it. The only other time travel story I've ever heard having that idea, that you can only go to the past because the future doesn't exist yet, is uh, 1994's Time Cop, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme. So there you go. But that, that was all the information they gave you, largely because they hadn't really decided. They hadn't really decided that the Doctor was indeed not human until it became apparent after three years that William Hartnell was too ill to continue. So they had this idea that, hey, maybe when he dies, he just turns into someone else. And it was only really from 66 onwards that they'd, they'd pretty much established that the Doctor was not human because he has this extraordinary capacity to turn into somebody else. The two hearts thing, I don't think was introduced until the John Pertwee era. You'd never heard the, no the name Gallifrey until 1973. The idea that Time Lords have a limited regeneration span wasn't introduced until 1976 and in fact directly contradicts stuff which the show had established earlier on. The, the, previous to that, the Time Lords had referred to themselves as immortal and you had the idea that there was this endless succession of regenerations. And certainly there's an episode called The Brain of Morbius, in which the Doctor gets into this telepathic wrestling match with uh, the disembodied brain of a Time Lord criminal in a sort of Frankenstein body. And the Doctor is regressed back through time. And you see, up until that point, the four faces of Doctor Who that you knew. And then this big long line of a whole bunch of other faces who are apparently actually guys off the production crew. The idea, I think, definitely implied that the Doctor that we were seeing, the Tom Baker Doctor, was not the fourth, that he was the, the latest in, a, in an incredibly long line of Doctors, which to me always made a lot more sense, because up until that point, we'd established that the Doctor was 700 and something years old, and that he regenerated every few years, but apparently he'd never done it until the end of the William Hartnell era, so apparently his first regeneration lasted 600 plus years, and all the subsequent ones lasted three or four years each which always seemed a bit weird. But this idea that Time Lords have an infinite, re uh, excuse me, a finite regeneration span was introduced in 1976 in a, a story called The Deadly Assassin. So they're constantly, well, establishing yet more of the Doctor Who mythology and indeed occasionally retconning huge chunks of it all through the evolution of the show. So the idea that in order for the show to work, you have to tell a new audience all of that from the get-go is just insane. So you don't need to. You've just got to introduce the Doctor. And also, you don't need to tie in to the continuity of the old show. Now, this is my idea. First thing I wasn't going to do was get rid of the Time Lords. I like the idea of getting rid of the Time Lords. I'm not sure how much I like the way that they're now backtracking from that. 
But if you're going to have the Time Lords gone, they should probably leave them gone. But, you know, the fact that they're now sort of gradually being reintroduced, and, yeah, whatever, I guess. Quite fun to have Gallifrey set stories again, I suppose. As long as Gallifrey looks like a cathedral like it did in Deadly Assassin and not like an upmarket hairdresser like it did in the 1980s. But I wasn't going to get rid of the Time Lords because one thing I thought would be quite fun to reintroduce is this fugitive idea. The idea that the Doctor is constantly on the run. So my idea was you start the show with a new Doctor, don't have to bring in, you know, Sylvester McCoy or Paul McGann or whoever to kill them off and have them turn into the... Much as they just started it with Christopher Eccleston, it's kind of implied that he hasn't been Christopher Eccleston very long in the very first episode, but you just start with a new Doctor. And he could have been there for years, he could have been there for a couple of weeks. Just start with your new Doctor, it doesn't matter. And I had the idea that maybe at various intervals he should be interrupted in the course of his, his adventuring by the appearance of characters I was going to call Time Rangers. The idea that he's being pursued by the Time Lords and they are sending these Time Rangers out to come and get him. And maybe even have a chief Time Ranger character, a kind of Time Lord Marshal Gerard character who is pursuing the Doctor and occasionally turns up at in insanely inopportune moments and tries to arrest him and drag him back to Gallifrey. And at some point, maybe, obviously, a, a fun thing to do would be to have this Marshal Gerard and his various underlings turn up at a really bad moment and have the Doctor persuade him that they need to work together to get out of the situation in which the Doctor now finds himself because, you know, this Marshal Gerard character is probably also going to be doomed himself if they don't work together. And then the Doctor would have to think of some way of giving him the slip once they'd resolved that situation. So that was just an idea I had. Bring back that fugitive element. And it would ultimately be explained why the fugitive element was so central to the plot in due course. Because the other thing I wasn't going to do was explain how, or indeed if, this new show ties in with the old one. That was the idea I had. Refuse to be drawn on whether this is a continuation or a reboot. So I think that would have been a fun thing to do. Because it would have put the fanboys and the newbies on an equal footing. Yeah? And this would have driven the fanboys crazy. And driving fanboys crazy is always a good thing to do purely in and of itself. Because the fanboys would be approaching this thing and, ah, ha, yes, we know all about this mythology. We know all about this show. We know all kinds of things that you don't. And then you would go, actually, no, you don't. You don't know about this show. You might do, but I'm not going to tell you. I thought it would be altogether more fun to just start with the new Doctor and refuse to be drawn on whether he is, as it would have been, the ninth Doctor or whether this is the first Doctor and we're rebooting the whole thing and, 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 and just leave everybody in the dark. And that way the fanboys and the newbies would have been equally at sea. And of course, ultimately what you would do is explain it over the course of the first two or three seasons and probably finally explain what's going on when your first Doctor of the new phase leaves, right? So maybe three or four seasons in, you finally explain what's going on because what you could do over the course of those first three or four seasons is drop hints drop hints as to whether or not this is all still the same show so maybe the doctor can start making references to shows from the previous phase so the fanboys go oh 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 i spotted that i spotted that that was a reference to pyramids of mars so this is still the same show and then you but start bringing in characters from the old show so you know when we finally get me you know wouldn't i wouldn't have brought the daleks back for season one but then you bring them back in season two and yeah maybe you have references to davros and maybe i wouldn't have brought davros back i still think davros should have been left dead at the end of genesis of the daleks that's a whole nother essay but yeah bringing davros back for destiny and all the subsequent dalek stories big mistake should have left him dead anyway so you maybe bring back the Daleks and you have references to all Daleks shows. So the fanboys are going, oh, okay, so this is still the same Daleks as last time. So maybe this is tied together. And then what you do is you start casting doubt on it. Maybe in his moments alone, this new Doctor can start expressing doubts as to whether he's up to the task. You can start sowing seeds of doubt to the audience's mind as to whether or not this is. Because here's the thing, Doctor, infinite range of faces. Anybody can be in charge of the TARDIS and calling himself the Doctor. We wouldn't necessarily know if it was actually the Doctor. You see what I mean? And then maybe a season finale cliffhanger. You introduce somebody who really knows the Doctor. Maybe Romana or somebody. And she says, I don't know who this is, but this is not the Doctor. 
So then you go into the next series wondering if this really is the Doctor. And then the reveal, which I say I think you would reveal sometime around the time that the first actor playing the Doctor in this new phase leaves, would be this. In my version of the story, the Doctor has become a legend on Gallifrey. Okay? Whole generations of young Time Lords have come up through the Academy hearing about this Time Lord who ran away and became this time and space hopping hero, doing all the good deeds, saving all these struggling planets, defeating all these bad guys, doing all the shit Time Lords aren't supposed to do. Okay? And he becomes a bit of a cult figure. He becomes you know, a, a proper legend among a certain kind of slightly edgy young Time Lord. Now, how's about this? At some point in the Doctor's life, he runs out of regenerations, obviously, and he decides to do the right thing. He goes back to Gallifrey to upload his conscience into the Matrix so that the Time Lords can benefit from this vast wealth of knowledge and experience that he has, which of course far exceeds the knowledge and experience of any other living Time Lord. So this dying old doctor limps back to Gallifrey in the old blue box, and this young novice Time Lord is given the job of looking after the dying doctor and helping him upload his conscience into the Matrix. But this young Time Lord is one of the Time Lords who's grown up hearing all about the legend of the Doctor. And when the Doctor dies, he has a sudden crisis and realises that the universe needs, if not the Doctor, then a Doctor. And rather than upload the Doctor's conscience into the Matrix, he, at great personal risk, crossloads the Doctor's consciousness into his own mind re-steals the TARDIS and runs away. So the original Doctor dies on Gallifrey and this new Doctor, the 14th Doctor, has set off to have more adventures out in time and space. That's what I would have done. That's how I would have done it. But of course what this also means is that there are now, hang on, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, there are now five Doctors that we haven't seen. We can have flashback episodes just occasional flashback episodes in which the doctor remembers the last time he encountered one of these bad guys and we have a flashback to the last time he encountered it and so we can have guest cameos from five different actors playing the five doctors that we never got to see so for half of one episode the doctor could be hugh grant or for half of one episode the doctor could be i don't know jeff goldblum or for half of one episode, the Doctor could actually canonically be Joanna Lumley. And here's where you introduce the idea of the gender fluidity of the Doctor. Here's where you introduce the idea that the Doctor's going to be a woman one day. Because they've spent two years in the show trying to soften the audience up to the idea that we were going to get a, a, a female Doctor. You had Missy, obvious um, primer for that. You had the Time Lord General regenerating into a woman at the end of uh, the last season, but one. So that was all very much trying to, you know, get the audience used to the idea that a female Doctor was coming. But this is another way you could have done it. You could have said, oh, by the way, there's already been a female Doctor. It was just in that bit of the story that you haven't seen yet. So that's how I would have brought back Doctor Who. Pretty much exactly how they did, except the Time Lords still exist, the Time Lords are after him, and the reason they're after him is because he's not really the Doctor. He's stolen the Doctor's mind and become the Doctor. So yeah, that's how I would have done it. Anyway, so there you go. That's the first... I think I'm probably I'm not going to do very many of these, but that's just... I thought I'd share that with you. That is how I would have brought Doctor Who back. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. I know most of you are seeing these through other means, but uh, the more subscribers the YouTube channel gets, the easier it is for these uh, videos to get some attention. And also, if you're not yet signed up to the Patreon plan, please do so. Um, it's really the only way I can keep producing content the way that I am thus far able to do. If you're not yet signed up to the Patreon thing, please have a look at it. You could become a part of this and become a very valuable part of this for as little as one dollar a month. I know it's all dollars. It's an American site. But please have a look at patreon.com slash Mitch Ben and see if you can help out. Okay. 
I will see you again as soon as I either, you know, get a beer in my bonnet about something or come up with another song. All right, bye-bye.